pray. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we come with a sense of what a wonderful gift you have given to us in the Bible. And we pray, Lord, that the gift would not be wasted this morning, but that it would be, Lord, it would uh, enter into us and change us for who you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 22. We're going to read along here. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Anon near to Solomon, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizest, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness, bear me witness, that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Okay, now, we've just finished in this, this, the, the passage above this, one of the greatest sections in the Bible where Christ met with Nicodemus and he took this master teacher of the Bible, Nicodemus, and it showed him, he showed him how he knew nothing about the Bible because he was blind to the great subject of the Bible, which is as Jesus put in John 5.39, John 5.39, when Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, they are they which testify of me. And as the eyes of Nicodemus were open, he saw how Jesus Christ is the subject of the book that he's dedicated his life to teaching, knowing and teaching. So as Nicodemus walks away from this meeting with Jesus at night, at Jesus at, at night, when he met him at night. This word, must, that Jesus said, just reverberated in his mind as he's walking away, and we can see him thinking to himself, Jesus said, I must be born a second time from above if I even want to see heaven. Jesus said, I must be born a second time from above if I want to enter into heaven. Jesus said, I must be born a second time from above if I want to be born from water to clean me. He said, I must be born of the Spirit of God. And he said that, he, he, as he was saying this to himself, he was saying, just like those Israelites who were bit by those poisonous snakes, and they were going to die, I've been bit by the poisonous snake uh, of my sins. I'm going to die eternally in hell unless I must be born again. So Jesus said that God's remedy to save Nicodemus is that he had to look with a life-engaged focus on Jesus when he was going to be lifted up on the pole. And, 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 and he, this whole message of, I'm going to perish, but I have an opportunity here to have everlasting life. This is what Nicodemus walks away for. So for us to directly look at all these must-truths that are concentrated in these first 21 verses of John chapter 3, it's like looking for us, for us it's like looking at the sun, at the sun. And we feel, when we read these verses, how, how the sun warms our cold bodies. And we feel how the sun takes 
depression of darkness away and we feel how the sun is a, has a healing effect and it makes us, makes us grow like a plant and it encourages us with hope that better, the better is before us. That's what these first 21 verses use, uh, do and the Bible specifically uses the analogy of the sun to represent Jesus Christ in Malachi 4.2. Malachi 4.2 says, But to, unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow as calves in the stall. What that verse, Malachi 4.2, is telling us is that when we respect the name of Jesus Christ as God the Son, and we focus our lives on him, then Jesus Christ becomes for us the sun, S-U-N. He becomes for us the sun that rises with the, in the sky with that brilliant, glorious sunrise. Jesus Christ becomes for us the sun that drives the darkness from the sky of, of our lives. It's very well known that people suffering from depression receive a healing when they just go out, close their eyes, and let the sun just beat on them for hours. It drives darkness away. Jesus Christ becomes for us that pure, perfect sunlight in a, with his pure, perfect righteousness. He becomes for us the suns that, that with, with its rays, which the Bible says are like wings that spread over us, and, and there's a healing of our soul's diseases that come. He becomes for us the, the, an, an encouragement, an encouragement it, when it talks about that you will go, you will grow, uh, you will go forth and grow as calves in the stall in Malachi 4.2, that's really referring to encouraging us to go out, go forward and bring others into what the Bible calls in 1 Peter 2.9, 1 Peter 2.9, others out of darkness into his marvelous light. So Jesus Christ becomes for us the sun that, that causes our roots to, just like the sun on a plant, just like the sun on a plant, it causes roots to grow deeper and it causes branches to reach higher toward the sun. And that's what Jesus Christ does for us. All wrapped up in that Malachi 4.2 analogy of calling Jesus Christ the son of righteousness that arises with healing in his wings. So in these first 21 verses of John chapter 3, Nicodemus has for the first time in his life experienced that Malachi 4.2, son of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings. And that's why these first 21 verses of John chapter 3 is the most used portion in the Bible to bring lost souls out of their own personal darkness into God's marvelous light. And, and this is who Jesus Christ is. So we're coming off now this great mountaintop of these first 21 verses in John chapter 3. And where do we go from here? We go into, and what we're dealing here, this passage, into some house cleaning problems with explaining where Jesus went, what John the Baptist was doing in comparison to what Jesus was doing, and some problems, that a uh, problem really, that came about with some of John's disciples and, and then how they got straightened out. So that's where we're going. Now, to me, that shows how the Bible covers all aspects of life. 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, 1 Timothy 2.2 2 says that with the Bible, 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So, first, we are told, in our verses here, 22, first we are told where Jesus was and his disciples went after this momentous meeting with Nicodemus. That's verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So he's moved from Galilee in the north to the south in the region of Judea. And, 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 and this shows us kind of a principle or a truth about Jesus' life. He was always moving. He, he moved a lot 
He was moving often. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 Jesus was like the Apostle Paul in his movements to these different locations. And Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 4.11. 1 Corinthians 4.11, he said, Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. Now, you turn to the back of your Bibles, and more than likely you've got a map in there of, of, of the travels of Paul, missionary journeys, whatever they call it, the travels of Paul in his life. Now, it was not that, that God could not afford to give Paul a nice house in one place where Paul could live out his days. That wasn't the issue. But God chose for Paul to have a life that he called hunger, thirst, nakedness, being persecuted. Why? Because God used all of those necessities in life to chase Paul, and, 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 and that's how we get these maps in the back of our Bibles, the description of where Paul was chased to. And as Paul went to those different places, Paul saw that as, as opportunities to Acts 16.10, Acts 16.10. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And this is why Paul, when he, he introduces himself to the Romans, in Romans, in Romans chapter 115, Romans chapter 115, and he says, he's got a readiness in his heart. He says, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. He, 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 when, he, when he comes to a place called Troas, he says in 2 Corinthians 2.12, 2 Corinthians 2.12, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me of the Lord. When he, when, and then, just speaking about his journeys, he calls them regions beyond in 2 Corinthians 10.16. 2 Corinthians 10.16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. And then, uh, and then he, he looks at his whole life and he says about his life in Galatians 2.2, Galatians 2.2, I went up by revelation and commuted unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So Paul was driven into these many far places to preach the good news that Jesus Christ is the Malachi 4.2, son of righteousness that has arisen with healing his wings. And that's why Paul said about where he was in this 1 Corinthians 4.11 statement, 1 Corinthians 4.11, where he said that he lived and he had no certain dwelling place. If you ask Paul, you say, well, Paul, I want to send you a letter. What's your address? He couldn't tell you. He couldn't, he couldn't give you an address because he has no certain dwelling place. And that meant, if you ask Paul, say, well, where can I find you next year? Paul would say, I can't tell you now. But, but what I can tell you is that I'll be where God sends me, and I know that's going to be in some dark place bringing light of God's Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ. And that made Paul's life exciting and purposeful. And if you said to Paul, Paul, wouldn't you rather just kind of exchange your life and live on that, that hillside on the island of Rhodes in Greece and look over that beautiful emerald see all time and sip drinks and take naps? <laughs> and Paul would say, that's boring. He would say, that's a boring, vain life, no purpose other than just to enjoy myself. And he would say, no, thank you. I would rather be like I am in 1 Corinthians 4.11. 1 Corinthians 4.11, even at this present time, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and we have no certain dwelling place. And that's why God wants us to not sit in some comfortable corner in life and live out a life of, of decaying comfort. But God wants us to move, move out reaching the lost. And when we look at the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we see lives of men that had no houses. But they were always on the move in tents, and wherever they went, people saw Jehovah in their lives. And as the patriarch Jacob, he stood at the end of his life before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It was a very interesting scene. 
two men so opposite, Pharaoh and Jacob. And Jacob says to Pharaoh in Genesis 47, 9, Genesis 47, 9, Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob, when he's talking about that, he's emphasizing these words, days, years, pilgrimage, few and evil, he says. But he says to Pharaoh in Genesis 47, 9, that his life was just a life of the days of the years of my pilgrimage. He's referring to how in his life he just moved from one place to the other. And, and what a scene that was. What a scene for, uh, uh, what a picture. Two men, Pharaoh and Jacob, Pharaoh living in one place all his life as the richest man on earth in a palace in Egypt, living what the Bible describes in Hebrews 11.25, Hebrews 11.25 as enjoying the pleasures of sin. And there this man Pharaoh, who had this, who had a life of where he enjoyed, he enjoyed what, 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 what people cannot afford. He enjoyed sin that people could not afford. And there he's in front of a man who looked a hundred years older than he was because of all the hardships he'd endured in his life. And Jacob looks at Pharaoh and says, in, in essence, he says, I wouldn't exchange my place in life with you because, Mark 8.36, Mark 8.36, what shall it profit a man like you if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Which is why Moses turned his back on all that. Moses had the opportunity to live that life of enjoyment. But instead, in Hebrews 11, 24, Hebrews 11, 24, it says, by faith, Moses, when he, was come, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the ward, of reward. There was a refusal in Moses' life. I will not be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I refuse what Egypt offers. And there was a choice in his life. I would rather suffer affliction with the people of God because I got, re and there was a respect. I respect the reward that God has greater than what Egypt can give. So Jacob and Moses walked out of the presence of Pharaoh and, and they could have sang the song, take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abides forever through eternal years the same. And this is what the Lord Jesus is expressing about him in this verse 22, when it says, in verse 22, after these things came Jesus, the disciples, into the land of Judea, and he tarried with them and baptized. He was always on the move. Jesus was always on the move. He was traveling. He was, he was on the move, traveling like the Malachi 4.2, son of righteousness with healing his wings, because there's a passage in Psalm 19, verses 4 through 6. Psalm 19, 4 through 6 that brings out beautiful analogies between Christ and the Son, S-U-N. And just as the Son reaches the ends of the earth, so Christ is described as the Son that reaches the end of the earth in this passage. I'm going to read it for you in a minute. In Psalm 19, 4 through 6. And, and, the, and the Son is beautiful as it comes out every morning. And Christ is beautiful. And the Son, is, the son runs to spread its Life-giving heat on a cold earth. That's like Christ. And so here's the passage. Psalm 19.4. Psalm 19.4. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Run a race. 
His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. And just as the sun does not keep its rays to itself, but the sun sends its rays to run out across the earth. So Christ was constantly on the move, spreading his rays of healing, of hope, of comfort, of illumination to the earth and becoming, becoming for the people of the earth a Matthew 4.16, Matthew 4.16, the people which sat in darkness saw great light and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And that's why we're reading in verse 22, after these things came Jesus and disciples in the land of Judea. Now, when Jacob stood before Pharaoh and said these, those words in Genesis 47, 9, Genesis 47, 9, they said, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. And then he says, few have been the days of the years of my life been. When Jacob said that, he was keenly aware of the fact that his life was very limited. He knew that. And that the composition, here's the, the, when Jacob looked at the composition of his life, he said it really amounts to just a few days to do the will of God. And when, jo when, Moses, when J Moses was 40 years old and he was standing in those courts in the palaces of Egypt, Moses realized that the composition of his life amounted to just really a few days to do the will of God and gain this high position that he did gain in Hebrews 3.5, Hebrews 3.5 3, where it says, Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. And when Jesus Christ looked at the composition of his life on earth, Christ was deeply impressed with how he had just really a few days to do the will of God. As he said in John 9, 4, John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. So what he meant that at, kind of like at various times, in the day, you know, you do this, you know, you say, what time is it? You know, and when you, when you look at that, you know, it's 1024 right now, if I got it right, I guess I do. But anyway, when you look at that time, you, you, you could say, okay, um, I, see the time that, I see the time that it is, I think of the time that's passed, I think of the time that I got left. Okay? And that's how God wants us to look at, our, at the composition of our lives. And we should be press, impressed with how we just really have a few days to spend here on earth. And we should think about the days that have, that we've, that have been spent. And also, we should, we should think about the, the days that are left that we have to spend so that we can become one of those described in Hebrews 11.13. One of those described in Hebrews 11.13, which says, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, just like now, today, during our day, we say, what time is it? That question is, it has behind it, how much time have I spent and how much time do I have left? These are the same questions that God wants us to ask about our lives with a, the with a question, what time is it? Which your question is, how much time do I spend in my life to do the will of God? How much time do I have left in my life to do the will of God? And those are the questions that God yearned for his people Israel to ask themselves when he said in Deuteronomy 32.29, Deuteronomy 32.29, oh, that they were wise, that they, would understood, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Because only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Jesus Christ will last. And this is what we see in the life of John the Baptist in this verse 23, verse 23. John also was baptizing in Anan near to Salem. What we see in that verse 23 is John the Baptist who was continuing to work in the mission that God had commissioned him to do. God told him to do this. Now, at this stage in John's life, he could have become discouraged at this point of life and says, what's the point of me carrying on baptizing? I don't have the crowds I used to. 
They're going to Jesus. I think the people are tired of listening to me. I feel tired and old, and it's time for me to just hang my hat up and retire. I've earned it. I feel like I've lost my touch. He could have done that. He could have done that. But verse 23 is telling us that John did not do that. John did not feel that way. Verse 23 is telling us that John was resolved to keep on doing what God called him to do regardless of the circumstances that he found himself in. He continued in his work as long as he had opportunities for John to work, and he did that. He was determined to go out of this world with his boots on doing God's work. And John was aware in verse 23 that Jesus was now baptizing. And that didn't bother John. And John found comfort, actually, in knowing that as he's ready to get off the stage, that there's another who's coming on the stage to take his place. That's why he said, he must increase, I must decrease. So he looked at his ministry, and he said to himself, I've not yet worked myself out of a job, because there are still people who do not know that they really are dirty, rotten sinners. There are still people who do not feel their intense need for Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God to take away their sins. There are still people who've not decided to come to Jesus Christ to be saved from their sins. There are still people who have not experienced the John 5.35, John 5.35, the burning and the shining light that John was said to have been, a burning and a shining light. That was a description that Christ gave to John the Baptist. And so John said to himself, as long as there's a need, I will continue in my role of being the burning and shining light, pointing people to Jesus Christ. And that's why we see John continuing to baptize in verse 23. And right up until verse 24, when John was cast into prison, we find John, John the Baptist doing what the hymn so beautifully describes in that hymn called Go, labor on, spend, and be spent. It's a fantastic hymn. I'm going to read you the words. Go, labor on, spend, and be spent. Thy joy to do the Father's will. It's the way the master went, should not the servant tread it still. Go, labor on, tis not for naught. Thy earthly loss is heavenly gain. Men heed thee, love thee, praise thee not. The master praises, what are men? Go, labor on, your hands are weak, your knees are faint, your soul cast down, yet falter not. The prize you seek is near, a kingdom and a crown. Go, labor on, while it is day. The world's dark night is hastening on. Speed, speed thy work, cast sloth away. Is it not thus that souls are won? Men die in darkness at your side, without a hope to cheer the tomb. Take up the torch, wave it high. The, the torch that lights time's thickest gloom. Press on, faint not, keep, watch, pray. Be wise, the erring soul to win. Go forth into the world's highway. Compel the wanderer to come in. Press on, and in thy work rejoice. For work comes rest, the prize thus won. Soon shalt thou hear the master's voice, the midnight cry, behold, I come. That's a fantastic hymn. Now, what is particularly, there's a lot of great things, thoughts in there, but one meaningful thought in that hymn, at least for me, it says, go labor on, your hands are weak, your knees are faint, your soul cast down, yet falter not. We are all in various stages of dilapidation. <laughs> We're falling apart. <laughs> Our doctor appointments are becoming more frequent. There are more conditions we have to check off when they give us that clipboard in the doctor's office of what's wrong with you so that the charts can be updated. There's an increasing number of things that we used to be able to do and we no longer are able to do that because the reality is our bodies are falling apart. And we're inching closer and closer to that category that'll give us that blue handicap sticker on our cars. Okay, in short, we're just growing old, <laughs> and we feel it, and it means that we're becoming more and more limited, and, and, and we are praying more and more to God. The prayer of Psalm 71.9, Psalm 71.9, cast me not off in the time of old age. 
forsake me not when my strength faileth. And that is the time we have to realize that God is saying to us in Hebrews 13.5, Hebrews 13.5, let your conversation be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, when, it, when Hebrews 13.5, when Hebrews 13.5 says, be content with such things as you have, that's not just speaking about physical wealth. That's also include health and abilities. So Hebrews 13.5 means be content with the health you have, be content with the abilities you have. If arthritis has crippled your hands and fingers so you don't have that strong grip you once had, my friend Alan has arthritis in his hand. We were out fishing, and I said, I, and I, it was deep. It was about 700 feet, and I said, Alan, real faster, and I realized he couldn't. And he said, I'm going at my own pace. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 13.5 is saying to us, be content with the grip you still have. John the Baptist was content with the grip he still had, and his health he still had, and he was using that to continue to baptize people in verse 23. In other words, as we see John the Baptist continuing to baptize, we're encouraged to not let disabilities get us down, because in this game of life, we are not alone. And that means in old age, we can hear, we can hear Psalm 73, 26. Psalm 73, 26, which says, my heart, my flesh, and my heart faileth me, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We can hear these words. They mean a lot to us. Psalm 92, 12. Psalm 92, 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall, stri they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. That's me. I'm fat and flourishing. <laughs> Isaiah 46, 4. Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age, God says in Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age, I am he. Even to whore hairs, whitehead, will I carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and deliver you. So just like the hymn says, the hymn puts it so well. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe from corroding care, safe from the world's temptation, sin cannot harm me there, free from the blight of sorrows, free from my doubts and fears, only a few more trials, only a few more tears. Jesus, my heart's dear refuge, Jesus has died for me, firm on the rock of ages, ever my trust shall be. Here let me wait with patience, wait till the night is o'er, wait till I see the morning Break on the Golden Shore. That was written by blind Fanny Crosby, who, who's, whose waiting did end with, wait till I see the morning break on the Golden Shore. Now, we come now to verse 25. And what do we got? A dispute in verse 25. There arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. So they came unto John and they said, they came unto John and, and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized, and all men come to him. So this section starts off with the statement. Now there arose a question. No, it says then. Then there arose a question. Now we've just been reading of the most important issues that a person can face in his life, which are issues about where a person's going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. And as a matter of fact, as we said here, the first 22 verses of this chapter might as well have been entered with a statement of, then there arose a question with Nicodemus, how he could ever see heaven, how he could enter into heaven. Or, then there arose a question over if a person's first physical birth was all that he needed to go to heaven. Or, then there arose a question over if every, every person is really a lost sinner on his way to an eternity of suffering in hell. Those are the issues that we've been the subject so far in this chapter. So when verse 25 starts with the words of, then there arose a question, we're expecting some great theme, some great monumental universal importance for all mankind. 
But we go on and we read in verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And that stuns us because we say, purifying? There's an argument about what is the best way to purify? And that's what some of John's disciples have engaged in. They, 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 to, to, take a, to take on, to take a side on purifications, on ceremonies, on traditions, on practices, on methods. I mean, we've been talking about sin, righteousness, judgment, redemption, salvation, heaven and hell, and now we're talking about the right way to purify? That's the hill they think it's worth dying on? A question like, well, is it sprinkling or is it immersion that's the best way to baptize? That kind of subject. Well, first of all, we see who raised these questions and they're identified as the Jews. Now, not the disciples, because, but, but those Jews who have no interest in, 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 in becoming disciples. The disciples were Jews. So it's not the seekers, the Jewish seekers, but those Jews who have no interest in coming to Jesus Christ. It's not the saved Jews, but it's those Jews who are not saved. And that's meant, and, and, the, and John means that by the term the Jews. Not obviously, it's not referring to all the Jews, because all the disciples were Jews, but all, but, but, and all of John's disciples, Jesus' disciples, John's disciples, they were all Jews. So when it says the Jews, in verse 25, it's referring to those Jews who were opposed to the Jew, John the Baptist. They were opposed to the, to, to, to the Jew, Jesus. And those opposing Jews have raised this, this question about what the correct method is of purification. they got no interest in being purified from their sins by any method that involved Jesus. They only want to cause a dissension. They want to cause an internal argument, a disruption within John's team. And that's why they've raised this issue about, well, what is really the, right, the correct way to purify? Now, there's a very important qualifier about, about who this argument got traction with in verse 25, and it's the word some. There arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews. Now that word some tells us it was not most, it was not all of John's disciples, it was just some. And so in other words, there was a small group within John's disciples that, well, in other words, the opposing Jews threw out this question about what's the best way to purify, and most of John's disciples did not take the bait. But some of John's disciples did take the bait, and they engaged in the argument. Those some of John's disciples were obviously the young and the inexperienced and the faith disciples who did not act wisely. The opposing Jews... They had no genuine interest in finding for themselves the right way to purify from sins. They only threw out the question in order to cause stress and tension and argument within John's camp. So though some of John's disciples took that bait and the dissension was able to spread. And that's a tactic of Satan. That's a tactic of Satan. Proverbs 6.16 gives a list of what God hates. Proverbs 16 says, these 16 says the Lord hate, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. This is what those opposing Jews were doing when they raised this question about purifying with some of John's disciples. They were sowing discord among brethren. Now this is one of the key tactics that Satan uses, and we need to be aware of it. We need to be not ignorant, because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, of his tactics, of his methods. Now, <clears throat> It may have been a valid issue, but considering the source of this issue, the opposing Jews 
and considering where that issue was going to lead to, discord among brethren, what some, what those some of Jews, John's disciples should have done was listen to Dion Warwick's song and just walk on by. <laughs> Foolish pride. <laughs> okay. But the problem is they didn't just walk on by, but the, the, those opposing Jews were pretending to be sincerely wanting to know. And, and those some of John's disciples should have taken a lesson from John when John saw those opposing Jews pretending to be sincerely, to sincerely wanting to be saved, and, he, and, John, and their, their, their leader, their rabbi, John, said to them in Matthew 3, 7, Matthew 3, 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? But they were young, they were inexperienced, so some of John's disciples fell right into the trap and they carried that point of dissension right up to the top to John in verse 26. Verse 26, when they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized, and all men come to him. So when those some of John's disciples came to John the Baptist in verse 26, we can see how the venom of discord that those opposing Jews had injected into them was already working its way into their, this, their souls of those, some of those John's disciples. Now first, we see them coming to John in verse 26, which means that they're spreading the venom of discord by carrying the words of those opposing Jews right up to John. And from what they said, we find out what was the exact venomous discord that, was, that, that those opposing Jews had injected into those some of John's disciples as they talked to John about baptism. So what those opposing Jews had told those some of John the Baptist is they were saying things like, hey, your great leader John the Baptist has competition because Jesus is also baptizing beyond Jordan. What do you think about that? Hey, Jesus is not just, he's not baptizing the same way your leader John is baptizing. He's got his disciples doing that. What do you think about that? Hey, all people are going to Jesus now in his baptizing. They're abandoning your, you and your leaders, John's baptism. Well, how about that? Hey, how do you know you're on the right team? Maybe you should abandon ship. Maybe you should abandon your leader, John the Baptist, and go join Jesus. Looks like he's got a better baptism. Now, that was the venom of discord that those opposing Jews succeeded in injecting into some, the souls of some of, the, of John's disciples, and it worked because what we can see is how those, that's some of John the Baptist, they got jealous. They got jealous of Jesus and that caused them to disrespect Jesus because notice who, uh, uh, notice how some of those John's disciples referred to John and notice how they also referred to Jesus. They paid respect to John in, in verse 26 as they called John in verse 26 rabbi. But they disrespected Jesus is they call Jesus in verse 26, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness. They don't even call him Rabbi Jesus. They don't even call him Jesus. They just call him the he that was with you, that you spoke about. And they came to John with this shocking news that was designed to try to get John to oppose Jesus. And they said to John, they said to John, you're not going to believe this, but that Jesus has betrayed you. He stole your gig. He stole it. He's out there baptizing. Everyone knows that there's only one John the Baptist. He's trying to become Jesus the Baptist. You trusted, they were saying in, in essence to John, you trusted Jesus. He's gone off behind your back. He's established his own group. He's copying what you do. He's probably plagiarizing your messages. 
He's probably preaching the same sermons you preach. And the worst part of all is not that he's copying you. He's been successful. Everyone is going to him, not to you. Now, what are you going to do about that? I mean, they were hot under the collar. They were hot under the collar against Jesus, and they were trying to get John the Baptist to become hot under the collar against Jesus. Clearly, though some of, jo of John's disciples were offended at Jesus, and that's ultimately where all discord leads to. It all gets back. It's like, it's like today. No matter what happens in the world, the Jews are at fault. No matter what happens with offense, Jesus is at fault. All roads of offense lead back ultimately to Jesus. Offense is so venomous and so dangerous. And we're so often in the position of John the Baptist where someone comes to us with some gossip and says, do you know what he did to her? Have you heard how he cheated? Did you hear how she treated that person? And all of that so easily affects us. And before you know it, we got fang marks in us because that offensive venom has just been injected into us. And the Bible says there's only one anti-venom that can protect us from the offense, and that anti-venom is Psalm 119, 165. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. It's the love of the word of God that has the ability to protect us from the venom of offense, from becoming bitter, from becoming jealous, from becoming angry against another person. And that's why it's so important for us in our lives to foster a love for the Bible. Foster a love for the Bible. How do we do that? We foster our love for the Bible by making the Bible our familiar friend. That means, like any friend, you spend time with the Bible. You spend time, we spend time, we foster our love for the Bible by spending time reading the Bible. We foster our love for the Bible by spending time studying the Bible. We foster our love for the Bible by spending time listening to Bible messages. And we foster our love for the Bible by spending time learning and singing Bible hymns and songs. Like the 300 hymns of sheet music, piano accompaniment, and singing on the free Friendship with God hymnal app. That was a commercial. <laughs> because Psalm 119, 165, Psalm 119, 165 tells us that when we love the Bible, we get a great peace and we get an anti-venom against the poison of offense. And John, he had that anti-venom. He had the anti-venom love of the Bible. And when he was presented with this opportunity to get mad at Jesus, as John responds in verse 27, verse 27, <coughs> John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. So John heard when those, some of his disciples came to him with the thought that you should be outraged, you should be shocked, this is a total disgrace to your pride. And when John heard that, John heard them say that he should think about himself, he should think how he has been personally wronged by what Jesus did, and John says, what John is saying in verse 27, verse 27, John is saying, you think I should rise up from my rights? You think I should defend myself? You think that I have inherent self-qualities that I need to stand up for and defend? Well, let me tell you something. When I think of myself, John is saying this, when I think of myself, my own abilities, my own inherent qualities, I think of myself as a man that, that, that can receive no abilities, no qualities, unless those abilities and qualities were given as gifts to me from heaven. All that I have by way of abilities and qualities and successes in life had all been gifts from God. And I owe everything back to the giver. That's what he's saying in verse 27 when he's, he's saying, James 1.27, James, sorry, James 1.17. James 1.17 is what he's saying. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, no changing, neither shadow of turning. 
So John was saying the same thing that Paul said when Paul was also confronted with the venom of, do you know that Apollos has stolen your show and he's a great minister? And, you sh- and you, you, we all know you are the only great minister. And Paul responded to that in 1 Corinthians 3, 4. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For while one saith, I'm a Paul, another of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I planted, Paulus watered, God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth, he that watereth, are one. Every one shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, you are God's husbandry, you are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I laid the foundation, another builds thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. This is exactly the same situation Paul was in, John the Baptist was in, Moses was in, when he was confronted with the poisonous venom of, you realize, Moses, that their Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp? Why, Eldad and Medad, they're stealing your position as the only prophet. Everyone knows that you, Moses, are the only true prophet of God. And these two men, Medad and, and Eldad and Medad, have usurped your position as a prophet. And all of that had one clear objective, to make Moses get offended and stand up and suppress Eldad and Medad. But Moses, he loved the word of God. He wrote the word of God. He loved the word of God. And because of that, Moses had a great peace and he, and he had the anti-venom and it had no effect of making Moses mad. And Moses said, this is Numbers 20, 11, 26. Numbers eleven twenty six. There remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them and they were of them that were written but were not out of the, out unto the tabernacle and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man. It's interesting it says young. And they ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the son of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all of God, the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So when it's all said and done, Moses holds out his, could hold out his arm and says, See, look for yourself. No fang marks. No fang marks in me. Those accusations against Medad and, and, and Eldad and Medad, you, you got no traction with me. And Moses could say that because of how Moses is described in Numbers 12.1. Numbers 12.1. Mir- this is another instance of somebody got mad at Moses. Two people did. Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So here's an instance where the very sister of Moses, Miriam, the very brother of Moses, Aaron, were so offended because Moses married a black Ethiopian woman. And they said that, that was over the top, that they were so offended to be made relative, related to, to a, a black-skinned woman, and they said, Moses, no longer qualified to be the only spokesman for, spokesperson for God. And all of that didn't bother Moses at all because he was so meek, and he, but, but all that talk bothered God. And, 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 and God said to Miriam, you like white, Miriam? You like white? Numbers 12, 9, Numbers 12, 9. The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. <laughs> That's God saying, you like white? And Aaron looked upon Miriam. Behold, she was leprous. She remained white as a leper until Moses prayed for her, and then only after seven days after Moses prayed for her, she recovered of her leprosy. But the point is, 
is that Moses was not offended at all, even though those things were said against him. Would to God we would be like Moses, we would be like Paul, we would be like John the Baptist. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for, Lord, these people that you set before us and showed us and teach us how not to be offended in life. In Jesus' name, amen.